Okay, we're going to take a look at the allegory of Animal Farm today, exactly how it fits in uh, with the history of Russia and how the story fits it. And you're going to find it fits very well. There are very few loose ends here. Uh, you'll recognize some of the things we're going to talk about from American history, from Western Civ. Some of it will be new. Uh, there's a section on this on the test. Uh, so take down some notes here. Pick out the important things and take those down. I do promise you that on the test, I will provide the Russian history and you will provide the animal farm. I won't make you pull the Russian history out of your head. That'll make it more fair because we're here to study animal farm, not the Russian history. But you should be able to make uh, the connections uh, on the test. That's what you're aiming at. What is going on here in terms of history? Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at is the author, George Orwell. Orwell is from England, from Great Britain. He was born a uh, middle-class guy. Um, he was very attracted to socialist ideas. He, he, he looked at the world and said, you know, why should the rich factory owners uh, be upstairs smoking their cigars and making all the money while the people who really do the work are downstairs making very little? Uh, the justice of socialism appealed to him, so much so that he was willing to go fight for it. And he actually left England and went to Spain uh, to be involved in a revolution there where the socialists were fighting on one side. Um, and the socialists gained some power. Uh, and Orwell was very disappointed to see then uh, that many of them um, betrayed their values and, and did exactly the things we were seeing from the pigs in Animal Farm. They let power corrupt them. Uh, and Orwell saw that uh, firsthand and, and was very disappointed. Uh, I think that's a large reason of why he wrote Animal Farm, uh, our fourth theme about the uh, merits and the abuses of socialism uh, are what he's trying to show. Now, he, he didn't show the Spanish history that he lived. Instead, he chose the history of the Russian Revolution, which is the biggest country ever to be taken over uh, by socialists. And he uh, is telling us the story of Russia in the 1900s through Animal Farm. Okay, uh, first thing you need to know about Russia is that uh, in the early 1900s, it was Tsar Nicholas II was in charge. And Tsar in Russian means king. Um, his uh, father before him had been king, and believe it or not, his name was Tsar Nicholas I. I know you're shocked about that. Uh, and he was not a very good king. The, the father had been a good king. Uh, Russia was a big country. It was an agricultural country. Um, you know, obviously the king lived better than the peasants, but the peasants were doing okay. And, uh, and under Tsar Nicholas I, things were okay in Russia, but under Tsar Nicholas II, it wasn't. Uh, number one, he just wasn't his father. He wasn't as good a leader. Uh, and it was at a time when the world was going through the Industrial Revolution, and yet Tsar Nicholas was, uh, was fine with just uh, sitting back and, uh, and continuing to have an agricultural country, even though it meant his people got poorer and poorer. And so eventually, uh, the Russian people are going to rise up and kick out Tsar Nicholas, uh, just like the animals rise up and, and kick out Farmer Jones. And so that's our first equal sign of the allegory here. Um, and, and they really did it for similar reasons. Uh, starvation, hunger, uh, like we said when the animals uh, kicked open the feed doors and ended up chasing Jones off the farm, uh, they did it because they were hungry. That's what uh, led them to, uh, to revolution. Okay, the Russian people revolt in 1917. It's, it's February. Uh, tired of their poor living uh, conditions, uh, they overthrow the Tsar. Um, it is socialists, uh, some of them, uh, but others uh, are, uh, are just people who, who want the Tsar gone. They wouldn't mind to continue a capitalist country or a whatever country. They just kind of wanted to elect their leaders, or at least they didn't want Tsar Nicholas II in charge anymore. Uh, but there's another equal sign in our allegory. The Russian Revolution, which happened in February of 1917, is uh, the running of Jones off the farm. Okay, now we have to stop a little bit. Uh, some of the Russian people were socialists. I'm going back here. Uh, we've got a guy named Karl Marx, who was actually a German philosopher, who wrote some books that were kind of the birth of, of socialism. 
And these reds in Russia, they called themselves reds, don't ask me why, why they picked that color. Uh, they wanted Russia to be a socialist country, and they got their ideas from Karl Marx. And Karl Marx had looked at the factory just like George Orwell and said, why, why should the big sm cigar-smoking fat cat boss be making all the money when he's not doing the work? He wanted factories to be owned by the workers. He wanted farms to be owned by the people working on the farm. He, he, he wanted the workers to own their jobs uh, and for them to make the decisions and for them to share in the wealth. Very similar to what Old Major uh, says about the animals, that the humans are just leeching, uh, leeching off the farm and that all the animals could live a lot more comfortably if they didn't have to feed the humans who, who didn't do any work. Uh, Karl Marx wasn't there for the revolution. He, he was uh, long gone and never went to Russia anyway. And uh, uh, that makes him old major. Uh, old major doesn't live to see the revolution, isn't there to fight the revolution. He just simply provided the ideas. All right. Now that brings us to a guy who actually was there. Vladimir Lenin, the leader of the Russian Revolution and the leader of the Reds. Um, he was the leader of the socialists, and after the Tsar was kicked out in February, and by the way, the, the Tsar made a run for it in a train, uh, was stopped by the revolutionaries, uh, pulled out and killed along with his entire family. Um, Jones uh, at least gets to go to the tavern and drink in Animal Farm. Um, but then Vladimir Lenin leads the socialists, the Reds, against the other people who had helped kick out the Tsar, the whites, they were called, who wanted it to be, continue to be a capitalist country. And they have a civil war in October. And, uh, and the Reds win, and Russia is now a socialist country. So that October revolution becomes the Battle of Cowshed. Remember when we talked about the Battle of Cowshed, I said, this is important because this marks the animals really taking control of the farm. The people are not coming back. Uh, and in this case in Russia, the socialists... When the October Revolution, capitalism is gone, the socialists are going to make Russia a socialist country. Uh, now, this means that Lenin, he's tough in our allegory. He's the only one the allegory doesn't fit. Uh, this allegory fits Russian history like a glove, except there's a sixth finger, and that's Vladimir Lenin. Lenin is kind of old major. He had lots of ideas, and he, he brought Marx's ideas to Russia. So in a way, he's kind of old major, but he's also kind of snowball because he really was there for the revolution. He did fight. Uh, he had lots of ideas. But he doesn't have a direct character in, uh, in Animal Farm, and you'll see more about that in a, in a little bit. Okay, that brings us to Leon Trotsky. Leon Trotsky was kind of Lenin's right-hand man, or those of you who know political metaphors, maybe left-hand man. Uh, he's another leader of the revolution. He's right there fighting with Lenin. He's a great speaker and a great organizer. Um, he is Snowball. Uh, Snowball is really him. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons why is that Lenin dies before Russia can really settle down as a country. In 1922, Lenin's dead. Um, of natural causes. Um, and that, you know, it takes a long time to get a country settled down. You know, think about the United States. The revolution starts in 1775, the Declaration of Independence in 1776. They win the war not until 1781, and we don't really have the Constitution that we have today till 1789. That's like 15 years. And America was a very successful and a very streamlined revolution. So, you know, Lenin wasn't, didn't really make it out of the revolution, you might say. He had a little chance to rule um, Russia, but not very much. So it's Trotsky who really carries on the ideas of the revolution, and, and he's an organizer, and he's a speaker uh, like Snowball. All right, that brings us to Joseph Stalin. Uh, now, I didn't talk about Joseph Stalin during the revolution because... He, he was involved in the revolution, but he was not a leader to the extent uh, that Trotsky and, and Lenin were. Um, I read one of the best books about the revolution. It's called Ten Days That Shook the World. It's actually by an American named uh, Reed, uh, who grew up in Portland, Oregon, and, and believed in socialism so much that he, uh, 
he took off and went to Russia to be a part of the revolution, hoping to bring that revolution to America eventually. And he wrote a book of his 10 days he watched the October Revolution happen as the Reds defeated the whites and took over the country. And in that book, he only mentioned Stalin twice. Once on like page 289 where Stalin is on some list of people who are involved in the committee. Uh, and then uh, one other time. Stalin did not play a huge part in the revolution. Very much like the Battle of Cowshed and the night that they kicked Jones out. We don't hear anything about Napoleon. Uh, Stalin is Napoleon. Um, he, is, uh, he is the backroom politician like Napoleon is. He's making deals. He's, he's promising people things. He's threatening people things. He's making his moves behind the scenes. He doesn't get up and make great speeches like uh, Trotsky or Snowball, just like Napoleon doesn't. Uh, and he eventually is ruthless in his pursuit of power. He wins. Trotsky is exiled to Mexico where he's assassinated by Stalin's uh, secret police, just like Napoleon chases Snowball off the farm. Now, I've got to backtrack a tiny bit here uh, to before Trotsky is run off to Mexico and assassinated. Uh, the Central Committee, uh, the Soviet Union, which is Russia's new name, uh, instead of having a strong leader, the idea was to have a committee of smart guys to make their decisions. They called this a central committee. Uh, they would have a central committee for the entire country that would make country decisions, and then each, like, factory or town, et cetera, was going to have so central committees to make socialist decisions so the workers could be making decisions. Well, the, on this central committee that's supposed to be leading the country are both Trotsky and Stalin. Uh, obviously, it didn't last very long. Stalin uh, consolidated power and consolidated power through lots of different ways, many of the same ways we've seen Napoleon consolidate power in the novel, and he became the supreme leader. Uh, so we add some things to our allegory here. Russia becoming the Soviet Union is equal to Manor Farm becoming Animal Farm. And the central committee idea would be the pigs. You know, the pigs were going to be the brain workers, right? That's why they needed those milk and apples. Uh, but we see quickly that it doesn't become a whole committee. Quickly, it's Napoleon versus Snowball, and then it's Snowball getting chased through the hedge, and Napoleon's in charge of everything. Okay. Uh, remember that one of the reasons for the Russian Revolution was that Russia had been slow under the Tsar to move into the Industrial Revolution. Well, Lenin and, and Trotsky had been saying that's, that's one thing we've got to do. In this new socialist country will move into the Industrial Revolution better than anyone else because our choices will be made by the workers. Uh, Stalin doesn't come into supporting that until he's chased Trotsky away. Sound familiar? Uh, of course, it's just like the windmill. So the modernization of farms and factories in the Soviet Union is the same as the windmill in Animal Farm. Uh, Stalin begins to try to modernize the Soviet industries. He has some small successes, but many failures, uh, just like Napoleon with the windmill, uh, you know, getting blown down in the storm. Uh, many of, uh, of Stalin's ideas, he used to have five-year plans all the time. Uh, they didn't work very well. Uh, any of the successes, uh, the plans, uh, Stalin would take, cre take credit for, even if they were really Trotsky's and Lenin's. So modernization equals the windmill. All right. Stalin ruled the Soviet Union through propaganda, propaganda and fear. We've been talking about that with, with Napoleon. Um, Stalin had a newspaper called Pravda, which has become synonymous with lies because the newspaper wouldn't print the news. It would print Stalin's version of the news. Nothing bad about the Soviet Union ever appeared, or if it did, it would be spun in ways uh, to make it sound good, you know, our rocket crashed exactly as we expected it to. Um, obviously, that's very similar to Squealer. Uh, Squealer would spin Napoleon's news and make it sound right, and he would he would do things like Pravda would do. Pravda would say, "Well, you don't. We want to support Comrade Stalin because we don't want the Tsar to come back." Um, just like Squealer says, we don't want Jones to come back. Pravda lied to both the Soviet people and to the world about Stalin's successes. Uh, he misled Western journalists. He would famously bring journalists from the United States or from England into the country, and he would show them a farm 
Uh, and this would be the show farm of the Soviet Union. They would pour all of their farming money into this one farm. Uh, and it would look great. And the Western journalists would see this and say, wow, if all Soviet farms are like this, they're so far ahead of us. Uh, that we can't even believe it. But of course, their farms weren't all like that. In fact, sometimes only that one farm was like that. And the rest of them were horrible and terrible. But by lying like that, very similar to Napoleon, filling the grain bins with sand and covering it with just a little grain, they could mislead people. And then finally, Stalin had his secret police, the KGB, who terrorized uh, any opponents. Uh, they would... Uh, they would threaten them. They would threaten their families. They would kill them. Uh, and uh, that's how he ran the country. Uh, secret police, if you've never heard of the concept of secret police, really what's secret about those police is what laws they're enforcing. Uh, you know, sometimes we have complaints about our, our police and we think, well, this police officer or that police officer did something that we don't like. But we always have laws to compare that with. We can say, okay, this police officer did this, but look, he did that legally. That's what the law says. We need to change this law. Or in other cases, we might say, oh, look what this police officer did. He broke the law, and, and we need to put him uh, through the justice system for that. In the Soviet Union, the KGB was operating under rules that were no one knew. Uh, and sometimes even they would operate secretly. No one knew who the who was the KGB? They'd be undercover all the time. People lived in fear of being turned into the KGB if they if they opposed Stalin in any way. And so the KGB uh, becomes like Napoleon's dogs. They were his hired thugs. They were really much more thugs or what we would think of as a gang or a mafia than a police department. That's why we call them the secret police. Purges. Stalin eliminated many of his, of his enemies and people who dared to, fight, to defy him by putting them in prison, threatening their families, or just out and out killing them. Uh, you, would, you probably have heard of Siberia, which is a northern, remote portion of Russia, very cold usually. There were prisons there they would send people off to, even you know, like famous authors who dare write things that Stalin didn't like. There's a man named Solzhenitsyn who... Uh, uh, wrote about his time in the gulags, the prisons of Siberia. Um, in Animal Farm, this is when the hens are starved for refusing to give up their eggs, or when the four young pigs are killed and, and Napoleon says they were plotting against him, or when S Snowball was run off. Those are like the purges of the Soviet Union. All right. In the 1930s, uh, the Great Depression, which we know about, the dirty 30s, right, in America, was really going on worldwide, and it hit Russia even worse because they hadn't modernized as much as other parts of the world had. Uh, Stalin's failed programs were making things worse. Uh, his people were so hungry and starving that he had to change some of his policies and deal with capitalists. Before, he had said, we will not trade with any capitalist country. We will wait for their workers to overthrow them. And then when they're a socialist country, we'll trade with them. Well, when his people were starving, he had to do something. And so all of a sudden, the rules changed, much like sometimes the uh, commandments uh, changed on the side of the barn and animal farm. So the 1930s, the Great Worldwide Depression, are like the hungry winter in animal farm. And trading with the capitalists by Stalin is like... Uh, uh, Napoleon trading eggs for grain uh, during that horrible winter. All right, finally we've got the lead up to World War II. As Europe is headed for World War II through the 30s, Stalin is playing both sides against the middle, the exact phrase we used about Napoleon er earlier. Sometimes it seemed as if he was going to take sides with England and America. Uh, other times it seemed like he was going to be friendly with Hitler and Germany. In the book, Napoleon is playing Pilkington against Frederick. Pilkington, the nice old farmer who just likes to fish and is just has a quaint little place, he's England, you know, castles and moats and tea time, right? Uh, Frederick is Germany. He is Hitler. Uh, he is the farm that is always acquiring new land and, and building new things and wants to be more and more powerful. And Frederick and Pilkington don't like each other, just like England and Germany knew they were heading for war well. Some people in England knew they were heading for war. Uh, and Stalin would play Russia. He, he wasn't going to take sides. Oh, maybe he'd take this side. Maybe he'd take that side. And he played them back and forth. 
And as you go to finish up the, uh, the novel here, you're going to see how Napoleon is either going to go into business for Fred with Frederick or Pilkington. He has this stack of wood. An animal farm really needs money to finish this windmill. And for some of the things the pigs now kind of like, you'll see that too. And the stack of wood is great old hardwood. And if you have a wood stove at home, you know that hardwood is, is very valuable. It burns longer, it burns cleaner, not so much smoke. And so Animal Farm has this pile of wood that was actually there from when Jones was there before. And it sat around getting harder and better. You know, aged wood is better. And so Napoleon is going to uh, kind of market that to either Frederick or Pilkington. And that's just exactly like Stalin negotiating with both Hitler and Chamberlain of England and deciding which way he'll go. So as you read the last chapters uh, and you see which way Napoleon goes and what happens when Napoleon does that, you'll get some idea of what happened to Stalin when he made his decision. All right, good job with the allegory. Remember, you want some notes on this, and, and we'll go over this again, but there's going to be a section on the test about the allegory. But like I said, I will provide you with the Russian history you will have to connect it with what you know out of Animal Farm. So don't think you're going to have to pull the Russian history out of your head. You're just going to have to be able to read the Russian history and then say, okay, that's when this happened in Animal Farm.